Hello and welcome to this Mithril Money Securities Investment 101 course. This is Lecture 10 on the Time Value of Money. Now, if you're happy with this concept, you might want to skip ahead to the next lecture. But for those who are interested, let's stick around and we'll discuss this really important concept, which is vital to understand before we can start pricing bonds. Now, in most lectures like this, you'll typically start off with a sequence of numbers that looks something like this. 100 to 110 to 121. But I'm going to be a little bit more basic than this and go to an earlier concept upon which this kind of typical slide is based. So let's have a look then at what's underneath here. I want you to imagine that you're an eight-year-old child and that you like cherry sweets and that it's okay for you to eat cherry sweets. Now I'm going to give you a choice. You can either have a cherry sweet today or you can have a cherry sweet tomorrow. It's one or the other. Most children, I would say, given that choice of one sweet today or one sweet tomorrow, will choose one sweet today. Because the thing in the future, over here, is worth less to them than the thing today. And that's a natural human axiom of human action. And that's called uh, having a time preference. You prefer things in the present than you do to preferring things in the future. Let's try and work out how many sweets it would take before the child became ambivalent. You know, couldn't decide, would have to toss a coin to decide to have the sweets today or the sweets tomorrow. Now, I don't think I could draw the 500 sweets that it would actually take. What I'll do, though, is draw five sweets and say, at five sweets, blueberry and gooseberry and cherry and banana flavour. And what other flavours can we have? I think we'll have an orange flavour sweet as well. With five sweets in the future, the child now is ambivalent. They can't quite decide which ones to have. Should they have this one? Or should they have this one? They're ambivalent. What that means is we found out their kind of inbuilt interest rate, their periodic interest rate here. So this present value of one sweet is equal to this future value of five sweets. These two things are equivalent to each other. And how we get from one to the other is we're going to divide the future value by some function of time to get to the present value. If one sweet today is worth five sweets tomorrow, remember at this point the child can't decide which choice to make, whether to have a one today or a five tomorrow, we've found a kind of interest rate. So the future value there is equal to the present value. Or you might say one is equal to five. Now, how did we get five to be equal to one or one to be equal to five? Well, what we've done is we've divided this future value by some function of time. We typically use an interest rate to do that. What we can see here is this is the original investment capital. And that's going to be dividing by one plus something. So the initial investment capital, and that's a strange way to view this, is that. Now what we need to do then is capture those other four things. What are those other four things? Well, that's a 100% increase, 200% increase, 300% increase, 400% increase on the initial investment. So what I'm going to do here is add on 400%. And if we take the mathematical notation of 400, so if 100% is equal to 1, then what we've just written there is we've got 1 plus 4. And that's perfect, of course, because 5 divided by 5 is equal to 1 there. So the key concept that we need to take away from this slide is that this present value is equal to this future value at the kind of given interest rate here of 400%. And um, what we've got to remember is that is equal to that but that thing on the right is divided by some function of time to get you to the left-hand side. That's if we're going in that direction. Or, if you want to look at it another way, this left-hand side is multiplied by some function of time to get to the 5. So it's going to be 1 cherry sweet times 5 equals 5, or 5 cherry sweets divided by 5 is equal to 1. Now let's get back to our more traditional diagram that we typically see whenever we see anything on time value of money. So I offer you a choice again of 100 today or 109 in the future. Now we're trying to find your ambivalence point, your kind of tipping point, at which we're going to call your interest rate. And you say definitively, I want 100. So we haven't quite found your balance point. 
let's offer you a choice then of 100 today or 111 in the future. And this time again, you say definitively, I want 111. And now we're kind of narrowing in, aren't we? We can kind of see where we're going with this, hopefully by now. So I offer you 100 today or 110 tomorrow. And now you're ambivalent. You can't quite decide, you toss a coin and you take either the 100 on the left or the 110 tomorrow on the right. So now we've found your kind of balancing interest rate. So how do we get from one to the other? There's the present value. That's equal to the future value. So we're saying then that 100 is equal to 110 with some kind of time function here. And you can probably guess what that is. It's times one plus 10%. That's the same as saying times 1 plus 0 0.1 or multiplied by 1.1. Now it's one year, so we're going to raise that to the power 1, but it doesn't make any difference. So we don't normally bother with that. So we found your interest rate. Your interest rate is 10%. But well, your future values are equal to your present values. Now I won't go too much into Austrian economics theory about uh, uh, trades always being unequal on both sides. That's probably a bit too heavy for this. Let's just go with it now. The 10% is where the two things balance out and where you're happy to kind of go with that. So now we can get a bit heavier and we can move on to the full time value of money diagram. 100 today present value is equal to 110 in the future given this time function of the interest rate. The thing that's between them is multiplied by 1 plus 10%. And we can divide going from right to left, and we multiply going left to right. What about two years? Let's try and find out then what some value is in two years, which is equal to the 100 today. What's the future value in two years' time that's equal to the present value today, given a natural interest rate of 10%? We could do this an old fashioned slow way. We could go down to the bank and we could put a hundred pounds into the bank at 10%. That would be one point one multiplied by hundred. And at the end of the year, you will have 110 in the bank. We've got to put the one. Why have we got to put the one? Well, let's get rid of this. That's actually 100 plus 10 of the interest. So the 1 captures the 100, your initial investment, and the 10% gives you your coupon rate, gives you your interest. That's why it's always 1 plus something. That 1 is to capture your initial investment. Now we figured out that we're going to have 110 in the bank in a year's time. And we leave the money in the bank because we're desperately trying to figure out what X is. So we multiply again. We wait another year. And that's going to be multiplied by... 1.1 and that will give us 121. So that's going to be a two year experiment. Heck of a long time to find this out, isn't it? So one year, two years to find out that the future value of 121 in two years is equal to the present value of 100 today, given an interest rate of 10%. And again, let's try and simplify this. How do we get from one to the other? Well, we could write, let's just move this 10% somewhere else. What we could do is we say 100 multiplied by 1.1 and multiplied by 1.1 equals 121. That saves you two years. Or we could simplify again and we could say 100 multiplied by 1.1 raised the power 2, because there's two of them. Why is there two of them? Well, it's two years, isn't it? Two years. And that's equal to 121. And how do we go the other way? Well, let's get rid of this clunky old fashioned way. That's just taking too long. And we'll squash this down and we'll move it up there so it's still available on the screen. We're at 121 and we want to get back to 100. They're equivalent, remember. And what we could do, first of all, we're going right to left, it's a bit odd, but let's just do it anyway. We could divide by 1.1. That would get us to. 110 and then we could divide by 1.1 and that would get us back to 100. Now that would be a really complicated time experiment in which not only are we going right to left, we're writing backwards, not in the Western tradition, we're also going backwards in time, which is very, very odd. 
or to make life a lot easier, we can just go 1, 2, 1 divided by 1, 0.1 1 to the 2. And where's the 2 coming from again? 2 years. So where's the 10 coming from? A 10 is 10%. And where's the 1 coming from? Well, we need the 1 to capture the initial investment. So time value of money works in both directions. We can discount 1, 2, 1 to move back to the present value, or we can grow the present value up to the future value to get to 1, 2, 1. So either way, they're both equivalent. Hopefully now you're comfortable with the time value of money. Let's just write down a couple of equations for you then. If you take the present value and you multiply it by 1 plus the interest rate, and you raise that to the number of years, that's not a very neat R, is it there? Then that will give you the future value. And if you have the future value, and you want to get to the present value, then you're going to divide by 1 plus the interest rate raised to the number of years. That's called discounting. And you can go either way. So now that we know the time value of money kind of theory, we can move on to pricing some bonds. See you next time.